Good morning. All right, good. You know, it's a joy to come into the presence of God this, um, this morning. I want to take a moment to welcome those who joined us for the very first time. If you're here for the very first time as our guest, would you like to just lift up your right hand or something like that? Oh, thank you very much for joining us today um, in our service. May God minister to you today and thank you for taking time to be with us. All right, did you know that our seats are not numbered? You know that, right? So here is what we can do. Um, you can stand to your feet and just try and occupy the chairs that are in front. So at least I get the feeling my church is full right now here. Can you do that? Come on. I know you guys are settled nicely, but still take time. Um, if, if you keep doing this, I'll give numbers. You know, I'll ask the, um, those who are at the, you know, I, those are our hosts. I'll tell them, give them the numbers. They'll come and sit in front then. I, I know today would have been a little, a lot of deviations in the roads, but thank you for making it today uh, to be with us. This morning, um, we're going to start a series called The Cave Ex Experience. I want to start off with four truths that we must understand um, as to why, you know, I want to talk about this particular um, uh, series. I want to talk on this um, particular topic. Um, did you know that depression has become the number one health issue in this world right now? That depression has become the number one health problem in this world. That uh, after the pandemic, um, it was told globally, the, the calls to the hotlines across the world that are, you know, the counseling uh, hotlines has gone up by 900%. That's a big leap in just last two years. Um, divorce rates, divorce filing up has gone up by 26% just in the last two years. Um, um, you know, I was uh, listening to the focus group announcement and I thought we should stop calling it divorce because it almost sounds like divorce. <laughs> Maybe we should come up with a better name for that. And over the last two years, 25% of young adults between 19 years to 30 years considered to commit suicide. Whether you like it or not, mm, you have to accept the fact that depression has become a real problem right now. Over 700,000 people, that's about 7 lakhs people commit suicide across the globe. This is according to WHO. 7 lakhs people across the world. This is only those who committed suicide and died. This is, the number is more staggering when you look at the people who attempt to suicide. That's about 21 lakh people who you know, at least try to take their li a life and out of them, 700,000 have died. In India alone, 13% death occurs because of the suicide, due to suicide. And among those who commit suicide in India, 32% are between the ages of 19 to 40. And I thought, man, that's the group I have in the church. I better talk to them about this problem, depression. Whether we, um, you know, no, ma no longer how long we, no matter how long we try to hide this, at some point it's going to come out. So depression has become the number one health problem in this world. It is real. That's the second truth that we need to accept now. That it is a real problem. Depression is a real problem. We can um, experience different types of depression and, um, uh, you know, from mild to severe uh, depression, from periods of depression. Um, but it is real. You can hide it so long only, you know, one day... Um, a person met another person at the church and said, hey, you look sad today. And the other person just looked at him and said, well, I'm sad every single day. I'm just better at hiding it till now. And just today I thought, I'm exhausted of hiding it anymore. So we are all experts at hiding. In different phases of our, uh, we use different faces to hide our depression. Ask me, I'm expert on that. Uh, how difficult it would be 
to go through a real problem in life and still make sure that you come in front of people or stand in front of the camera and put, us, put on a smile so that those who are listening to me, uh, to the word, can actually feel better. Uh, it is a real problem. And we are all dealing with that. One out of nine people are going through some kind of depression today. So that simply means out of the 100 people who are sitting here right now, um, no, minimum of nine people or 10 people are actually going through depression. I can actually think it's, it's a little more than that number, you know. So it is, uh, it is real. But here is the third truth. It is not a malfunction of the mind. That I think we need to understand. It is not a malfunction of the mind. It's just a signal that something is going on in our lives. In, in, within our body, there may be some real biological reasons why we are going through depression and experiencing that. Um, but if we limit depression to a biological issue, I think we'll miss the whole point. I think there might be some real problems with our spiritual life and our life itself. It's just a signal. We are just human beings with unmet needs in some parts of our lives which kind of move us into that place. It could be um, um, an unexpected job loss. It could be a loss in the business, a losing financial uh, security. It could be a problem within the marriage. It could be a divorce. Something or the other would affect our lives and, and um, you know, we move into a depression, a phase of depression because we have neglected to deal with that. And I actually be started believing that church must take up the responsibility on talking about this one issue that people are suffering with and are, have become good at hiding it to just help them. Hey, you know, there is a solution for it. And we all need to understand there is a solution for what we are going through um, right now. The, the fourth truth that I think we must uh, address and we must learn is this. One of the major reasons why we don't talk about depression and one of the major reasons why we have become experts at hiding it is because there is a stigma attached to it. That if you talk about what you are going through, people may look down on you. That you may actually, you, you, you know, you, you get scared that people may um, call you mental. Um, so that's why you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to share it with even the people within your family because you got, you're, you're getting scared talk about that. But because of that, I think we have, you know, lived our lives completely, un you know, completely isolated and keeping ourselves um, from receiving any help. Even if God wants to offer, you need to be ready to receive that help. Um, some of us have become so experts in, in hiding it that we have physically become sick. If we need to, uh, if the church wakes up, and I felt if the church wakes up and identifies that issue and begins to talk about that and say, you know, you've got to deal with that. And there is the, the reason why God wants us to become a community is because of that, so that we can help each other. We can nudge each other in the right direction. Maybe, maybe there is a hope for those who are going through depression and some of them are at a point where they are contemplating suicide. Because you, 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 you know, you, I, you, you kind of um, attached your identity with, uh, with uh, depression and you, you feel like, I don't want to talk about it because I don't want anybody to um, call me that. Truth is this, my illness is not my identity. I think depression is just like any other physical issue. Right? Just because I wore the specs right now, you don't judge me. You don't judge my character. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't think there's something wrong with me. I just can't see. And you kind of figure it out that, well, you know, he can't see clearly. That's why he's using glasses. That's all. Right? Yes or no? I'm, I'm touching some nerves right now, right? <laughs> Relax. And I think there's a great solution for us. Just like how my eyes need attention, my mind needs attention. And I think Bible has a great solution for it. Scriptures actually help us in dealing with very important area of our lives 
so that we might defeat it and uh, regain our strength, the strength that we all need. And I looked at the scriptures, and let me begin with my conclusion, because I think if I keep talking about depression, you'll be depressed today. So <laughs> let me begin with the conclusion that I want to give, and then uh, I'll talk about the depression itself. God wants us to be free. God sent his son to this world to, to die on the cross to set us free, to set us free from every bondage that is, um, you know, keeping us, uh, you know, uh, as slaves. God came to set us free, not only from our sicknesses and sins, but also from the areas where, you know, we are, our minds are bound because of something and, uh, you know, those bondages, God actually sent Jesus to die on the cross for that. The Bible actually says that in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1, it is for freedom that Christ has come. It is, it, is, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So God does want us to be free. He does want us to live full lives, happy lives, with meaning in life. That your life has a meaning. That's what God wants to convey to each one of us. God wants to convey to us that he wants you to be happy in life. That he wants you to, you know, live with life with full vigor and, and, and enjoy what God has given to you here on earth. You, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to see you mm, isolated in your own homes and uh, in your mind, separated from him and, uh, and, you know, live in a gloomy world. He doesn't want you to do that. If you look at the scriptures, you will find all faith heroes, well, not all, I, I don't want to classify everybody into that category, a lot of great faith heroes struggled with depression. How do we know that? In their words, when they express their anguish in the way that, um, you know, uh, in, in the way of words, whether it is a poetic language, whether it is a direct declaration, they have talked about how difficult it has been for them to get through the phase that they are going through. Like in the Old Testament, you got this classic example of Jeremiah, a great prophet who's been used by our Lord to minister to hundreds and thousands of people, an entire nation, but had suffered with depression for the most part of his life. The he, in fact, uh, was going through such great depression in his life that he wrote an entire book on his depression. It's called Lamentations, by the way, in the Bible. And this is what, in his own words, in chapter 3 of Lamentations, verses 17 uh, to 20, let me read that for you. Um, this is what it says, I have been deprived of peace. And some of you may identify with what I'm, what I'm reading right now. I have been deprived of peace. There is no peace in my life. That's what he's saying. I have forgotten what prosperity is. I don't even know how, you know, how, how to be blessed in life. I just lost everything. So I say, my splendor is gone. And all that I hoped from the Lord has not happened. That's what he's saying. I've, I've lost everything. I thought God is going to do something. God didn't do anything at all. I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall that I'm going through. The gall is the word that they use for the drink that, you know, that was, tried, that was offered to Jesus that was bitter. So he's saying, my mouth tastes like, uh, you know, I'm, I've tasted gall and I'm going through, uh, you know, this, this phase so he's saying, not only I feel bitter in my heart, even my physical body feels bitter. I remember them. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. There's no joy within my soul. There's no joy within my spirit. I, you know, I, f I feel like I'm just down, drowning. So if uh, Jeremiah is one example uh, from the Old Testament, the New Testament talks about um, another great giant of faith, um, uh, Apostle Paul. There's something wrong with my mic. Um, Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, um, talks about um, uh, you know, how he has gone through um, a serious depression in his own personal life. In 2 Corinthians chapter,
we do not want you to be uninformed, my brothers and sisters. He's writing to the church in uh, the church in Corinth, and he's he's saying, I, I, I want I want you to know. I know you guys look up to me. I know uh, you know I'm your pastor, but I want you to know that I suffered a lot. He begins to say, I don't want you to be uninformed, my brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we have experienced in the province of Asia. They have put me in. They have put us in such under such great pressure. That is far beyond our ability to endure. So we despaired for life itself. This is Apostle Paul talking about, this is the guy we look up to for faith, for encouragement. And he's saying, listen, I, I struggled a lot with depression. And there's a point where I thought I'm going to die. The pain and the suffering that I endured... It's not just the physical, it's the rejection from people, it's the isolation, it's the, it's the time that I'm spending in the prison, it's the time that I'm away from home, it's the time that I, I, I'm alone traveling uh, all across the globe. I feel lonely and there was a place where uh, the suffering got so much that I actually thought I'm going to die. So um, depression is not new, and the Bible does not shy away from talking about it. In fact, the Bible talks about some of these great giants who suffered with that to tell us, hey, listen, it's a, it's a thing that every human being goes through, and we are there. I'm there. God is trying to tell, I'm there to help you to get through that. And there's no better person in, in the scriptures who can give us a complete picture on why do we end up in places like that, in depression, and how God helps us to get out of those places, and how God resets our entire life so that we can move, move forward. And so the, the, based on that thought is how this entire series is born. Uh, today we're going to talk about how do we get into those areas, the cave experiences. Uh, why do we end up there? And then we're going to talk about next week on how do we get out of that cave? How does God help us to get out of that cave and so that we can move on in the future? And what does God do after he gets us out? How he sends us back where, uh, why he sends us back to the places that he wants us to go to. So today we're going to address that one area of our, that the first question, how do we end up in cave? How, why do we end up in the cave? Because uh, the, the guy we're going to talk about is probably uh, one of the most familiar uh, pictures of the scripture found, in, um, you know, found both in Old Testament and New Testament, the prophet Elijah. He's called the greatest prophet who ever lived on the earth. He's, we are talking about the greatest prophet who ever lived on the earth. A prophet who's been taken up by God in order to prepare him to send him back to this world uh, in the end days. And so such, as in, such is the importance of this figure. And uh, that kind of person has gone through a real depression in his life. And I think it's, 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 a good, uh, it's a good thing for us to just have a look at him and kind of figure out what caused him to end up in the cave that he ended up. Would you like to turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19? And that's where I would begin uh, uh, his story. We would look at his story. When Ahab had gone home, Elijah just finished a great, great job. He's done a great thing. Okay, just the chapter before. So that's what, um, you know, this verse actually means. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. Now listen, she didn't go directly to him. She just sent a message. It's like she sent a WhatsApp message, okay? And, and she said, may God strike me, may God strike me, even kill me, that if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. You got to underline that. If Elijah got afraid for his life, we all will, invariably. And we will all, just like him, flee from our troubles. Just like him. And so don't be ashamed that you're running away. I'm just trying to help you to get back. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. That's a big mistake. We're going to talk about that. 
He left his servant there. Then he went alone. That's a bigger mistake. Uh, into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. We all will come to that place, by the way. Maybe you've been there, maybe you're there right now today. And just like him, you probably are praying the same prayer. He's saying, I've had enough, Lord, he said. I've had enough with this life. I've had enough with this job. I've had enough with this uh, relationship. I've had enough with everything that's going on in my life. He said, take my life. For I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Isn't that why most of those of us who are going through depression always want to sleep? But I, Because I think we kind of think that if I can sleep it off, at least I'll forget about what I'm going through. And I guess that's what he was trying to do. But as he was sleeping, the angel, an angel of the Lord touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was a bread, ba uh, a bread baked on the hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. I mean, that's like, he's, he's actually hit the rock bottom, by the way. He's, I mean, God is trying to strengthen him. He's like, nah, I just want to lie down. I like lying down. I don't want to get up. Then the end, that's how depression feels like. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Uh, so he got up and ate and drank and then uh, and the food um, gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave. So let's, uh, let's look back. He ended up in, in cave right now, and that's where he spent that night. It could be possible that you are on the way to your cave, or it is highly likely that some of you, well, a lot of us, are already in the cave at this point of time. And it's important for us to look back and see why did Elijah end up in the cave? What made him to you know, find himself within the cave or on this, you know, set him on the journey to a cave? I'm going to give you six reasons today as to why do we end up in the cave. Next week, we'll talk about five ways God helps us to get out of the cave. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about six things God wants us to do after he gets out of the cave. Does this make sense? Well, the number may increase, you know, based on what the Holy Spirit would speak to me, or decrease too. But today, let me talk about six ways Six things that make us end up at the cave. The first thing is what I want to call life's imbalances. The imbalances of life. The word uh, that he said to the Lord is something that kind of gave me a clue into what Elijah was saying. I've had enough, Lord. He's saying, you know, the things in my life I have become now unbearable. There's, there's no more balance in my life. There's, you know, I just can't keep handling this pressure. I can't keep handling these people. I can't keep handling the circumstances that I find myself in. I really need to get out of this. He has come to a place where too many things are overburdening him, which uh, he either purposefully took it upon himself or just were laid upon him. He just couldn't take those in a book called Lost Connections, um, an author by the name of uh, Johan Harry says this, we need to talk less about the chemical imbalances in life and more about the imbalances in the way that we live in this world. And it's true, and I think he's right. Elijah's, if you look at Elijah's life, Elijah's um, you know, depression came after two major victories in his life, right? He, the, the, the chapters preceding that, you would see Elijah is really in his, uh, in, in his heights. He was successful. Everything that he picked up, he got success. He, he really got. I mean, he made it to the top. It is um, really important for us to remember this. That Satan attacks us at the height of our victories. Remember that. Satan uses people 
Satan uses circumstances to attack you at the height of your best, you know, at your best. So that he can distract you from what God wants you to do next. Throwing you off that, you know, peak into a real a valley and a valley of depression. So if, uh, as I looked at why Elijah actually, you know, came to a place where this guy who just killed 800, 850 Baal prophets with his, with his you know, single-handedly, who's got this great victory. It's not just those Baal priests that he killed. The whole point is this, that he actually stood up against an entire nation, right? He's, 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 he's done some great work. But the, he got scared by a text message Jezebel sent him. I'm going to kill you tomorrow. He got so scared that he ran away from, uh, from, from that place. And I kind of started trying to put the pieces together and, and trying to figure out why did he do that. And I realized this, that um, when you're tired, um, you're not at your best. When you're tired, you're not at your best. We are never at our best when we are tired. Remember that. And that's when uh, th that would probably be the best time Satan to attack you because you're not at your best. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, uh, mentally, you're not at your best and that's when Satan would attack you because you actually got tired climbing up to that place of, of these victories and this success and you just reach there and you're like, Okay, let me relax. And that's when. And here is another thing that I've realized that when you're tired, you are most vulnerable. That anybody can attack you, even a single text message can scare you. And that happens because of our you know, imbalances in our lifestyle, trying to balance the relationships, trying to balance our health, trying to balance our jobs, money, and everything is, you know, we, we, and we need to. I understand that that is our responsibility to balance stuff, but because we over-focus uh, on certain areas of our life, life gets imbalanced and leading us to a place of vulnerability. An author by the name of Stephen um, wrote a book called The Depression Cure. And this is what he says, and I, I think you got to, you kind of, you know, he kind of nailed it when he made this statement. He says this, we are never designed for a sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. Well, that's an Instagram worth quote, right? And he accurately pictured all of us. We're never designed, never designed for sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, password lane, sleep driven, fringy pace of modern life. Exactly what's happening for the last two years. Oh, well, even prior to that, too. In, in fact, the lockdown that should have slowed us down actually increased our pace. Maybe we just got slowed down for three months and then we just got, oh, well, this is a great place to pick up. And we began to do so much more, so much more that we were trying to grab everything by both hands. Everything by both hands. Money, things, by both hands. Working so hard so that, well, this is giving me a great opportunity. I don't have to travel. I can make more. I can keep more. I can get more because uh, we are tuned to think uh, one is good, two is better. That's how we are tuned to think. But Bible talks about the contrary. Bible says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6, better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. But we are tuned to think two. I mean, one rupee is good, two rupees is better. Uh, one biryani is good, two biryanis are better. Uh, you know, one car is good, two cars are better. 
one wife is good, two wives are wrong, by the way. Okay, just. Order your lives. Listen, order your lives. Give attention to the pace that you're putting your life in. Uh, you need to slow down. That's number one. Number two, the second one is, um, is uh, what Elijah said next. He said, I'm no better. I'm no better. I'm no better than my ancestors. Of all the things, the one thing that he shouldn't be doing at that point of time is that he sits down in that state that he was, he was under the, the, the broom tree, the solitary broom tree. Uh, as he sat there, the one thing that he kept doing in his mind is he's comparing his life with others. Comparison is the major, one of the major reasons why we get into depression because we keep comparing ourselves with others. What in the world his ancestors have to do with what he's going through right now? But he's looking back at his ancestors, looking at all those people who made it in life and began to compare his life with them and then began to feel more miserable about his state. His state. Comparison is the thief of joy. Theodore Roosevelt once said that. Comparison is the thief of joy. Rick Warren um, once talked about the three major lessons that I've learned in my life as a leader, um, you know, with over 60 years as a Christian, 40 years as a, as a pastor. This is, this is what I've learned, three things that he had learned. He says, um, he says um, uh, never stop learning. That's the first thing. If you want to be effective as a leader in anything that you do, never stop learning. Number two, never compare yourself with somebody else. Never compare yourself with some other leader. Never compare yourself with somebody who is, you know, your colleague. You just can't. It will only discourage you. It will never encourage you. And of course, the third thing is never give up. Never give up the job that God gave you. You know, I think one of the reasons why we have now become the society that compares, that, that is driven with comparison, is because, uh, um, you know, we have become... A, a narcissistic society with a lack of identity. We don't really know who we are. That's why we want to find ourselves. Uh, and the, uh, you know, we end up naturally comparing ourselves with somebody else. We are so obsessed with ourselves that since we can't find ourselves, we are looking for, at somebody so that we can be like them. Why do you think social media has become such a big thing in the last few years. We want to be the guys who, who would send that quote first. We want to be the guy who would put that quote first in our instas or our reels or we, 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 you know, we want to outdo somebody else. We want to have more likes, more views. We are driven by our self-obsession with, with ourselves. I don't know how, how else to phrase it. And it kind of, you know, is driving us more and more towards a lack of identity of ourselves itself. Here is another reason. The other reason is this, that um, we are being mentored by our peers. Now, when you, when you study on mentoring, on coaching, um, and coaching is a big word right now, right? Across the world. Uh, when you talk about coaching, one of the major things that we talk about, Robert Clinton is one of the you know, top leaders on coaching. He, you know, basically, he's the textbook guy. He talks about three types of coaching in our lives. We all need those three types of coaching. Number one, we need people who are more experienced to coach us. We also need people who are journeying along with us to coach us uh, because they give us ideas. These guys give us experience. And we also need to coach somebody else so that you can actually get better ideas from those who are catching up to you. So you need all those, uh, that entire circle, spectrum of uh, coaching. Um, but we have stopped taking the elder to younger coaching. We are fo focused more on peer to peer coaching. Now, peer to peer coaching is good for ideas, but peer to peer coaching is not good for experience. Because they're just like you. They're going through the same issues like you do. They're also trying out new things just like you do. 
you know, when you depend your entire life on peer-to-peer -peer coaching, uh, make decisions based on that, we mess up. Make bad decisions. That's why it's always important for us to go to people who are more experienced than us, because they can look back and say, nah, you may think that is good right now. It's not good. We may not like what they tell us, but they will tell us um, what is good for us. So, but because we are so much focused on peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, we begin to compare ourselves uh, with somebody else. And you know, somebody said this, that this particular focus on that um, peer-to-peer -peer coaching, mentoring, amplifies our mental triggers 100 times more. Leading us to complete mental health breakdown. Hmm. I think it was Chris Hodges who said this, talking about social media, he said, we compare our miserable life with somebody's highlights reel. Galatians chapter 6, verse five, 4 and 5. Each one of us should test their own, te their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to somebody else. For each one should carry their own load. Bible is wise, you know. It already talked to us. Don't, don't do that. Don't compare yourself. You'll only di get discouraged. Remember, we all have different assignments in this world. We're all different. We're all here with a different assignment. That's number two. The next few I'll run through, okay? The third one is what, what I want to call ruminating and self-talk. You know what ruminating is, right? In Indians, we are very familiar with the cows right in the middle of the roads, right? Um, maybe not in Hyderabad, but everywhere else. <laughs> Uh, and you, you, the one thing that a cow does as it sits right in the middle of the road is keep chewing back the cud that it already took, right? The, this whole thing, keep doing that, right? That's called ruminating. That means you're eating the same thing again and again and again and again and again and again, talking to yourself again and again, again and again. And I think most of us do that. And that kind of drives us to a place of complete uh, madness. I shouldn't have used that word. Complete depression. Basically, rumination is a focused attention on the symptoms of one's distress. You keep focusing on the things that are making you sad and keep thinking about them again and again, again and again. And as you begin to think, again, you think of them again and again, you are not giving an opportunity for solutions. Ruminating um, is oppo uh, opposite of finding solutions, basically. Now, how do we do that? By self-talk. If you look at what Elijah says, I'm the only one left, he says. The one thing he keeps saying, repeating all through the next passage too, as you keep reading them, you'll find the one thing that he keeps telling himself and he keeps telling everybody else that I'm the only guy left. I'm the only guy left. I'm the only guy left. Nobody else is there for me. He wasn't. Next week, we'll talk about that. He wasn't alone. It was a lie. A lie that he kept telling himself and he kept telling everybody else. I was alone. I was alone. I am alone. I'm alone. 95% of your emotions are determined by the way you talk to yourself. Those are not my words. Somebody else's words. I'm just repeating myself. 95% of your emotions are determined by the way you talk to yourself. Bible says that's why in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Where do we get all this? In this. In this. And the peace of God, and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. You're looking for peace? Paul says, if you can begin to think about the words of the scripture, the God of peace himself would be with you. 
So basically, in other words, I'm trying to encourage you, control your mind, you would control your life. Control your mind, you'll control your life. Number four, the first thing um, is, is what I want to call the inability to process pain. The inability to process pain. We are not good at processing our pain in a healthy way. Life is tough, I know, I understand. And truth is, everybody medicates. Now, literally, you may not go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and take depression medicine. You may not do that, but we will find something else as our medication. We will find something else as our replacement for pain. We all feel pain, and then we all do something about that pain. Like him, who went to sleep all the time. I mean, you know, if somebody was around him, they would have got mad. You were always on your bed, nothing doing. What are you doing? Always lights off. The only thing that you can hear is the fan, the sound of the fan and nothing else. Is that how you want to live your life? That's what exactly Elijah was doing, by the way. It's an unhealthy way of processing pain. So God brought health to him. You know, the right way to process the pain. He began to first physically make him stronger so that he can deal then with him emotionally later. We'll talk about that next week, but for now. Look at the way he dealt with his pain. Many of us medicate ourselves in a well, very unhealthy uh, way. It could be drinking, it could be binge eating, it could be, you know, it, it kind of becomes the way to cope up with our lives. A, a binge watching Netflix, or playing video games, or working more. Uh, so that you can try and drown out your pain. Viktor Frankl um, is, a, is, a, um, is a great uh, author. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, in which he kind of, uh, he kind of says, listen, I, I actually don't believe what Sigmund Freud said about life. Now, Sigmund, Freud, Sigmund Freud's theory, you know Sigmund Freud, right? Sigmund Freud's theory about life is this, that life is about pleasure. All of us are always thinking about pleasure. And all, all of us are trying to do something for pleasure. That's what Sigmund Freud said. Every, our actions, our behavior, our thought patterns, our talk, everything is defined by the way we, we want to enjoy life, right? That's, that's his theory. Uh, uh, Viktor Frankl says, no, he's wrong in that. He says, life is not about pleasure, it's about meaning. And when you don't have meaning, you'll dull yourself with pleasure. So he began to work with, um, after World War II, he began to work with patients who are suicidal, um, specifically those uh, Jewish prisoners who have been in Auschwitz and other um, concentration camps, and after they were delivered and they're being treated, he specifically worked with them. Some of them have just given up on life and they're just waiting to die or you know, planning to commit suicide. And he specifically worked with them and um, um, uh, come out with a th therapy called logotherapy. He, he calls it logotherapy. And he says uh, three things that he did with all those um, patients that were given to him. First of all, he gave them some meaningful work to do. He gave them some meaningful work to do. Something that matters to others. Something that you know it matters to others. Something that you know you, know, you do uh, like, like just giving them food and tell them, why don't you go and find out people who are hungry on the streets and give them the food. It kind of, you know, an action that brings some kind of meaning to what you're doing. So gave them meaningful work, put them in a community of friends who accept him, who accept that person unconditionally. Because all of them are going through some kind of issue in their lives. And they all know that we all are going through some kind of issue in our lives. Let's just not judge people the kind of community. Well, I think God's picture of church is that. I kind of feel God, God's picture of church is that, that we don't really judge people by their actions simply because we are just like them. So with all those patients who are you know, trying to help each other up, a community of friends who love you unconditionally, take whatever, the third thing is this, uh, he taught them to look at their suffering and find something positive out of that so that you know, they can help others. 
who are going through similar experiences. I looked at that and I started smiling because Viktor Frankl was not the first one who said that. Bible said that. In first, Second Corinthians chapter one, verses four to six, you remember the, uh, the, the quote I read talked about how Paul felt he was you know, at a place of despair. He wanted to, he thought he's gonna die. He, he says this, God who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. But just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. So what, what Paul is saying, hey, listen, the pain that I'm going through, I'm going through and I'm receiving help from God to come out of that so that I can help somebody else who will go through the same pain. Number five, um, is what I want to call isolation. Isolation and loneliness. You remember I told you the one thing that Elijah shouldn't have done but did is when he began to run away from Jezebel, he had somebody else with him. But once he reached to a place called Beersheba, he said, you stay, I want to go alone. That's a big mistake. We all make that mistake. Isolate ourselves with the friends that we should have been with. You know, from the friends that we should have been with. And the more we isolate ourselves, the more we are opening ourselves for Satan's attacks in life. Isolation is a trap, remember that. The first problem in the Bible is not sin. The first problem in the Bible is isolation. The moment man and the woman were separated, Satan got an opportunity to hit. Hit them. Hit them so hard that, you know, we are still recovering from it. That's probably why God looked at man and said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not a marriage verse, by the way. It's a, of course, we read that in the marriage. But actually, it's a verse God talked about, the human condition itself. The way I've created man and woman is that they should not be alone. They should always be part of a community. Well, I'm glad for Zoom. I'm glad for YouTube and Facebook. I'm really glad that during the pandemic, it really helped us to stay connected. But it has now become an excuse for us not to be in a community of people. It has now become an excuse for us to keep staying away from the very thing God wants us to be in, a community of friends. We need each other. Remember that. We need each other. Romans chapter 12 verses 5 says, Since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other. And each of us needs all the others. One third of all the adults suffer with feelings of isolation and loneliness. And more than half of young adults, specifically young adults. We got so accustomed to remote learning, we got so accustomed to online services, we now have forgotten that we need somebody else beside us. We need each other. When was the last time you told your wife or your husband that I need you? We all need each other. Turn to the person who's next to you and say, I need you. Now, do it. Do it now. Do it now. Don't shy. I need you. You need me. Tell them. You need me. We all need each other. We just can't isolate ourselves. Number six, the last one is this. It's, a, I think, one of the major reasons why we suffer with depression is because we are in a spiritual warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare. We are, again, fighting against dark forces who are trying to destroy our lives, our communities, our families, under the leadership of Satan. The only job the enemy he has right now, and I think the only thing that kind of uh, you know, keeps him running, and that's his oil, 
And that is this, that if we give an option to him to attack us, he would attack us without hesitation and destroy us. Listen, we are not human beings having temporary spiritual experiences on a Sunday morning. We are not human beings with, te- uh, you know, who, who, who are having temporary spiritual experiences. We are spiritual beings having temporary human experience. Don't forget that. Bible talks about that. You are a sojourner. We are all sojourners in this world. The, the life on earth is temporary, Bible says. That's why Paul says, with all the suffering that I'm going through in my life, I stop focusing on what I am experiencing and focus on something that is eternal. All this is temporary. Satan wants you to flip that and make you think your life is all about human existence, but that's not what it is. Specifically as a Christian, you need to remember that you are a human being with, uh, uh, you, you are a spiritual being with temporary human experiences here on earth. And because you are a spirit being, there is a war in the spiritual realm. And it is real. The more we go back to Elijah, the more you will kind of begin to realize that, that we are not at fight with each other. We are at fight with something that is, that, that, that we don't see, but that is real. That is real. And that is something that we need to fight against. We're all smart people. And I want to I don't want to talk from an emotional point of, point of view. I want to show you why the spiritual warfare is real through the scripture itself as we keep going throughout this series. This is a fight against forces that are trying to destroy our lives and our families and our church ultimately. Not just our church, the church globally. Now listen, what would you be, what would you be willing to do if I told you tonight a robber is going to come and th- uh, you know, steal your home, uh, the things at your home, what would you be doing? You'd be like, and a pastor will say all those things, it doesn't matter. Would you do that? What if it is real? What if it's really a burglar is going to come and burgle your home tonight? I mean, there may be a possibility of truth in that. And even that thought itself would make you defensive. Would immediately put you in a defensive position. Even if you don't believe what I just told you right now, that a burglar is going to burgle your home tonight, you're still going to go tonight and still make sure that you're going to double lock. Just and if somebody asks you, why are you doing that? You'll say, no, you know, I don't really believe what pastor said, but I still want to make sure my house is safe. If you're so careful about that thing, don't you think you should be more careful about the one real thing that you are in a spiritual battle and you really got to put up your defenses against the one, one person who's trying to destroy you. That's why Paul um, you know, tells us that God had provided us a full armor, a full armor. Put on your full armor, the full armor of God, so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. And then he goes on to list out what is that armor in Ephesians chapter 6. Go and read it. Start putting up your defenses around you, around your children, around your family. You really need to start taking this seriously that we are in a spiritual battle. We really need to fight against this. And here is, here is the truth. That God has already won over Satan. And that's truth. What he had done at the cross has actually defeated Satan. Satan is a toothless enemy. He can only roar, but he just can't. Like Jezebel, he can only text message. He really can't do anything. I'll talk about that next week. Uh, he really can't do anything against us. But... God has given us the ability to defend ourselves against anything that attacks us. And you can fight back. Be ready. Um, And all that was possible because of what Christ has done at the cross. He's given us the resources to stand firm. He's given us um, promise 
that you will be able to withstand him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Peter says that. Resist the devil and he will flee, flee from you. He just can't do anything. You, you just have to stand your ground. and Say, no, nah, I'm not going to listen to you. And that's all he can do. Can only speak to you and try to threaten you. He will run away from you. And that is possible because of the cross. But today we are going to remind ourselves of that truth when we partake in communion. You know, as you partake in the bread and the cup today, um, can I have the worship team back on stage quickly? Um, when we partake in taking of the bread and the cup today, remember that, yes, we, we, what we hold in our hands is a symbol of our salvation. It's something that you know, brought our salvation to us, set us free from the sin, given us a fresh start in life, new purpose to live for what Christ has done at the cross, the broken body and the blood that was shed for us at the cross. But it also is a reminder to us that Christ has already finished the victory. And it is a reminder to you and to me that, listen, don't give in. Don't run into a cave. You don't have to. There's a solution against your depression. Jesus paid for it at the cross. Remember that and, and talk, you know, talk to yourself. Instead of negative, talk to yourself and say, God has already given me the victory. And this is a symbol of that. The bread and the cup. This tells me that I am victorious. This tells me that nothing can destroy my life. Nothing can destroy my marriage. Nothing can destroy my children. Nothing can destroy my home. Nothing. No weapon formed against us shall stand against us. You know? The Bible talks about that. So let's close our eyes right now. Take a moment to reflect on that. Thank you for being patient today. But I think it's a very important talk um, for us to listen to today. So I took an extra time. I'm going to request our ushers to come forward and, and ask me to help um, help me to you know uh, to distribute this bread in the cup. I'm going to go ahead and you know pray for this, but I want you to pray for yourself and say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for what you have done for me at the cross for my salvation. At the same time, for my victory. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this. Eat it. Take it and eat it. Every time you drink it, you uh, take it, you remember what I've done at the cross for you. In the same way, he took the cup of uh, wine after the supper and said, this is my blood that was uh, poured out for you as a new covenant. Take uh, Every time you drink it, remember what I've done for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the broken body and the blood that was shed for us. We receive your grace and we receive the victory that is achieved at the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As the worship team begins to sing, we're going to distribute the cup and the bread to you. and Take it, take, take out the wafer and keep it, um, keep the cup open, ready for for all of us to partake in this together. If I've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you are eligible to partake in communion with us uh, today in this place. The Savior alone carried the cross for all of my debts. He paid the Salvation complete, now forever I'm free. Calvary, Calvary, the Savior alone, the Savior alone, the Savior alone carried the cross for all of my debts. He paid the Salvation complete, forever I'm free. Calvary, covers it all. Calvary, covers it all. My 
sin and shame don't count anymore. All praise to the one who has ransomed my soul. Calvary, Calvary, it all. If all of you have received it, would you like to stand to your feet? Take the cup and the bread into your hands. One more time, let's give a, um, an offering of thanks to our God at this time and uh, tell him thank you for the cross and thank you for what you have done for me. Once again, Father, we thank you for the broken body. We recognize the pain that Jesus had to endure so that he can set us free from all our bondages. And we accept this. Um, as we partake in this, we recognize that we are free from our from from our sin bond from the from the bondage of death and from the bondage of depression. We are free. Let's all partake together in taking of this bread. Thank you, Jesus. Father, once again, we thank you for the blood that was shed at the cross and it washes away our sin, makes us clean. And now we partake in this, God, recognizing that we have a fresh start and we don't have to keep looking back, we have to keep moving forward because we, um, you know, you have a great, great um, days ahead for us and we don't have to let our circumstances dictate how we feel, how we live out today. We know what you have achieved at the cross now um, gives us hope to look to future. Thank you. Let's all partake together in taking up this cup as we remember the blood that was shed for us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's join the worship team one last time as we sing this chorus and then we will close with the word of prayer. Our ushers are going to collect the cup from you. Um, don't throw it down, just hold it in your hand. Calvary, covers it all, my sin and shame don't count anymore. All praise to the one who has ransomed my soul. Calvary, covers it all. sin and shame don't count anymore all praise to the one who has ransomed my soul Calvary covers it all thank you for being patient today with us um, I know we, we are already 11 but just don't rush take time to meet people just say hi uh, make sure you're on the other side and not within the sanctuary and I think the second service would start another couple of minutes so do give them the opportunity to begin their worship um, and 10 minutes from now but you have that 10 minutes window to, to meet people but stay back for hours together outside no problem with that All right, at the lobby not outside at the lobby you can do that let me pray and close Father we thank you once again for the joy of worshipping together um, I thank you for speaking into our lives. Uh, if we are in the cave, help us to get out of the cave. If we're running towards the cave, remind us that we don't have to get into the cave. And God, help us to put up these defenses that you've already granted to us from the attacks of Satan, knowing fully well that we don't have to fight. The battle belongs to the Lord, and the victory has already been established. So all we have to do is resist. And so help us to resist. Bless you, God, for today. I want to thank you for everyone who joined us today. Would you please continue to work in their lives, in their families, and as we continue to gather together as a community of believers, would you continue to help us to grow um, 
and become a strength to each other. People become the church so that we can be on the mission with Jesus uh, because the world needs healing, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the love of our Father, and the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, now and forever, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together and praise our God. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week. Do meet people.